Hello again, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Discovery Road. I'm James Nelson. You know, it's not unusual at all to see a warm, fuzzy blanket draped across the landscape out here. It's sort of like a forever stamp of the American West, symbolizing jobs, history, a way of life, or to put it another way, sheep count. funding for Discovery Road provided by the National Park Service. A century ago, wool growers were king of the hill. Herds numbered in the thousands. A million sheep could be counted within the borders of the state of Utah. And prize rams, one prize ram, could bring in over $6,000. Sheep played a significant part in the economy of Mount Pleasant. All small towns started out agrarian, and so agriculture declined as the Industrial Revolution came along. They decided to get into the sheep business. Sheep was much more popular back then, both uh, mutton and lamb and sheep. Uh, the, the meat that came from sheep was a significant part of the diet. So prolific were San Pete Valley sheep, they were coveted around the world. The Mount Pleasant Pyramid newspaper wrote, 700 of Mount Pleasant's finest Rambouillet sheep will be shipped the latter part of this week to Russia to be used by the peasants of Russia to improve their stock. The deal involved the three big wheels of the day. John Seeley and Sons, 265 head, W.D. Canlan and Sons, around 200 head, and John K. Matson, another 279. Sheep were also sent to Japan and Mexico and around the United States. Champion sheep, trophies, and prosperity. There was even a sign bragging about sheep painted on a mountain near Thistle, Utah. It's gone now, but maps today will show you Canlan Mountain and Canlan Springs. Hints about yesterday's sheep glory. I think the Canlan uh, breeding of sheep was significant not only to the uh, San Pete County economy and, and to what was going on in the times, but they also uh, were able to get prizes for it uh, at the Utah State Fair. There's a couple of trophies and some brochures that indicate that. They would sell uh, sort of starter sets, or at least they wanted, and other countries wanted to improve their flocks, and so they would buy sheep from uh, W.D. Candle and Sons. They sold it to uh, Japan. Um, Mexico and Russia. More of the sheep story in a timepiece of Utah history. Long ago in Fountain Green, Utah, a watch owned by Andrew Agard was traded for a single black-faced ewe. Agard, whose family learned about sheep in Denmark, plied his trade into a massive herd of 25,000 breeding ewes. He helped other Scandinavian and English immigrant families build their herds, and the sheep industry took off like a wild rabbit. Fountain Green, excuse me, was a poor town, and he just helped the other gentlemen in town and with family men to start their own herds. Because of this, Fountain Green became to be known as the richest little town in the state of Utah. Diane Agar Jorgensen knows sheep history. Both sides of her family have contributed mightily to the story. That brings us to the family story. We 
do everything as a family. Uh, my dad's here every morning. My son's here. My grandson and granddaughters are here. My daughters. We uh, we all work together. We couldn't do it alone. Uh, we all pitch in. We all have different things that we do. We do, and uh, it's just a great way of life because we're together every day, doing things together, and uh, we count on each other and we need each other to to make it work. I love it. Everything about it, it's just the way of life. You wake up in the morning excited to go to work, you get you go home tired every day, and I don't think there's a better feeling in the world. Drive the trucks and keep the sheep fed in the springtime and just help dad and grandpa. We go from from here to the mountain and uh, from the mountain back down to the fields and from the fields to the desert. And it's a, it's a long ways to the desert. Uh, it's nice to have trucks to be able to put them on to go to the desert instead of trailing them all the way there. A rainy and busy spring day on the Jurgensen family farm. We're just moving these sheep to, over into the Cedar Hills. So we're just going to take this bunch of used lambs and load them up and haul them to a different location. Hey, Arch. Come here, boy. Now, cuss him. Cuss him up. Cuss him. Cuss him. Get him. Come on, cuss him. Get him. Neil, do you ever get tired of this? How many how many years you've been working on these uh, sheep operations? Seventy. I've been ever since I was ten years old. So. You ever get tired of it? No, that's all right. It's just like everything else. You do what you have to do. Glad to have the family carry it on. Oh yeah, that's nice. We want to keep going on forever. Pass it down. Then it happens. Amid the noisy roundup, a lost lamb, an orphan, commonly known as a bummer, is discovered and scooped up to safety. He's a bummer, so he got kicked off his mom, or she died, or something, so he's a little bit kinny. So we'll take him home and put him in the bummer pen. He'll come home with us. Huh? We'll feed you. Yeah, we'll take care of you. When I was younger, I still remember feeding the lambs with a bottle with my mom. That was just probably my earliest memories of, of the sheep themselves is feeding the orphan lambs with my mom. And that, that's something that will stick with you forever. And even to this day, you'll still do it. And it's, it's a, something, once again, that sticks with you. And it just kind of ingrains itself into every part of you. The Jorgensons all take turns feeding the lambs, learning the correct techniques and connecting to something important. Yeah, I believe there's always an, an instinct um, that maybe as a mother and a wife that you see that might not come to the men a lot of times and it gives a different uh, look to the things that, that they might see. Um, raising a family and our children here um, it, it always has given a motherly instinct um, to teach our children to learn about the animals and to care about them and, and to be kind and, and to learn that they have uh, a spirit and, and they are each individuals, these animals themselves too. These lambs represent the future for the ranchers. You can find their likeness in art, music, and of course religion. And if you're lucky enough to ever hold one of these, well, Let's just say it's a moment that you won't soon forget. Every year, Lamb Days is celebrated in Fountain Green, Utah. And yes, the best lambs are auctioned off. Three and a half, 75. Three, 75, here and a half, and a month, 75, and a half, and a month, 400, all right, 400, four and a quarter. Four and a half, four and a half, 75. 500. Five hundred. Five hundred dollars here now, but about a good five hundred. Five hundred. Boy, she don't crack, does she? We need five hundred. I'm in the cellar right here. You better hurry, young lady. 
Going for 475, and we stole it, 475 dollars right there. So I'm Tiffany Peckham, and we just sold our lambs because the sheep show was yesterday, and there's sponsors that buy Hello, our lambs and stuff. How long did you raise this? Uh, I've had him since the beginning of May. What do you think about it? All right. Good, I guess. <laughs> it's kind of hard, but all right, he's in. it's good. Of course, it's all part of life on the farm. A growing up day, one more good hug, and a goodbye. And so it goes. I'm going to go six and a quarter. Sold it right here, $600. Thank you. A little crowd control on a quiet rural road in central Utah. And right there, yes, that's him, the guy we're here to spend some time with. Welcome to the Larson Sheep Company. They're uh, coming around wanting feed. We feed them a grain pellet as well as uh, alfalfa. And uh, they're just kind of used to a vehicle coming through and, and feeding them. One of the first things you learn about sheep people, they always seem to be counting sheep. Why are a few of them blacks? What's involved with that since you're in the business? We, we use them blacks for for counters, we usually uh, try and keep one per hundred is kind of the way we we arrange it. But uh, in this bunch here, there's there's only seven blacks and they're about 900 views. I use them as markers, the herders, when they're out on the range, they can count them and try and keep all the sheep together. It's a big and very productive sheep operation just out of Ephraim, Utah. A work hand walks the big barn checking empty lamb stalls before the next delivery. Packaged, bulging wool bales from a previous season sit idle, waiting for a better price to pop up. And more sheep to count and keep track of. Well, that requires everyone's help. Then, the sound of a haircut. Lots of haircuts. Here, the wool comes off, where the artful yet tough sheep shearing world lives. Usually it's a nondescript shed about the size of a railroad car. The sheep are unloaded and lined up for the fun house. Most of them wait patiently. Inside, a light bulb swings from the rough and tumble action. Music pours from a lone speaker and argues with buzzing tools high-heeled sounding sheep hooves, while a stench tells everyone to keep moving. Those people that come there, that lady told me she had never seen, she didn't know what wool looked like <laughs> coming off of a sheep. Ray Larson likes showing his ranch to people, and when it comes to letting people know how it all works, like getting the wool off, he tells them good hired help. And it's not easy. They know how to handle the sheep so they don't cut the sheep up. And, uh, and they're not rough on them so that they, they'll miscarry. Uh, but part of them are from the U.S. here. Uh, there's, what, there's four of those which are from either New Zealand, Australia, and some from Great Britain. Yeah, it's just um, a six mil comb. Chinese, just making it a bit sharper so um, it can enter better. How often do they need to be uh, sharpened? Every day. Really? Mm -hmm. If not, what happens? You just won't cut. Won't cut. Yeah. 
Can you tell? How do you tell when they're when they're they're not cutting or what? Yeah, they're just not cutting. Just got to push it off a bit more. I like them. I like them sharp, so I can just don't have to push them so hard. Otherwise, you end up blowing your wrist up. And the sheep seem to like that nice, clean, close shave from the shearers, like 30-year-old Brian Johnson from Manti, Utah, a matter-of-fact sort of guy who loves this way of life. Well, I was born into it. My dad uh, sheared for Randy since, and well, Ray, Terry, since I was born. And then uh, he started shearing from all the way from the Canadian border to the Mexican border for years and years, that's what he did. And then uh, I just more or less was born into it. Peek inside the haircut booth and you know it's hard work. According to Johnson though, that's what forges the friendships made around the world. I consider all of them friends. I've, I've, some of my best friends are from all over the world. I just returned from uh, shearing in New Zealand uh, right before I started here. And I'll go from here to England and then Scotland. When I'm finished the shearing season here, it's a, it's a good way to travel the world. Like an international exchange program of traveling artists, the shearers bring their vast experience to wherever the work is. Oh, this is sheep shearing. I, uh, I did my first first full day 48 years ago. So um, we travel the world and just take the wool off the sheep for the for the farmers. Um, we work New Zealand, Australia, America, England, Wales, Scotland, and uh, oh, it's it's quite a good life. A bit hard on the on the relationships, but yeah, it's a good life. And then it's just in high, intense labor. The sheep are strong, they're pregnant, so they're uncomfortable. Racing each other, trying to see who can put out the most numbers, the cleanest, the, the fastest. You get paid by the head. The more you do, the more money you make. So that's the motivation to, to doing it. Yeah, no, I, I enjoy the lifestyle. I'm getting a bit old for it now. And, uh, I'm starting to think about you know, staying home and keeping warm and yeah, taking it easy. But uh, you know, someone generally rings up and you know, and I just say, oh well, yeah, I'll come, I'll come. You know. There's one more story about sheep shearing you should know about. It involves this man, soldier Zane Taylor, Purple Heart recipient Zane Taylor. His book, Lesser Heroes pays tribute to those soldiers he served in World War II with. Then there's the story of Zane Taylor's father, his hero. He was really my hero because I had spent some time alone with him sharing sheep for two months, so I got to know him. The sheep story of LeVar Taylor is an incredible footnote worth bringing to the front porch. Taylor was the best when it came to shearing sheep. He traveled across the American West, served as president of the Sheep Shearers Union of America. He even sheared sheep on the mall in Washington, D.C. So massive were his sheep shearing efforts, he made it into the Guinness Book of World Records for shearing over a half million sheep. But his biggest feat might have been his love for his own flock, his family. I found out by being with my dad how really tough he was, how hard he worked to provide for his family. The fact that he worked really hard, it helped me when I got in the Army and had to go over in Patton's 3rd Army, and I was in the infantry, and the infantry is the guys up front, you know, they're not back somewhere else. a member of General George S. Patton's 3rd Army, a proud foxhole soldier, recipient of the Purple Heart, and a proud son of a hero, the almost forgotten sheepman, Lavore Taylor.
That bark is a warning. The Great Pyrenees letting us know we don't belong here. These sheep are taken. The bark of experience, lots of experience, says it all. The Great Pyrenees can be traced back to Europe. Basque sheep herders developed the dog to protect their herds. Yeah, punch is really important because if you, if you don't have a dog, when you start to work with the sheep, you can't do nothing because uh, I think that this is more important to help you. The dog is more important than one guy, than one man. It's the best help you can have it. By screening a bit of old film, we discovered there is more than one job for dogs in sheep country and a working dog like this one is a pretty valuable employee. These days, a view from above shows the incredible talent of sheep dogs. Yeah, my, my dog's name is Tony. He works in uh, maybe 500 sheep. He worked this was He working dog. It's a, he bring the sheep, everything, and yeah, the dog is a, he make all over the job. It's a, no dog, no no good sheep. The dog he, he make all over the job. However, long before this happens, there is this scene down on the farm. Adorable little puppies, future sheep herders and part of the farm family. How old are these puppies? These puppies are about two weeks old. Uh, uh. And how are they going to become sheep dogs? Or? Yes, this is the border collie breed and they are our sheep dogs and we use them to herd. So we'll train them um, and a lot of times our herders will use these to gather the sheep up and keep them together so they don't get lost and um, they don't get killed by predators and stuff like that. So. Along historic Highway 89 in Utah, it's not uncommon at all to find yourself stopped, stalled, or smack dab in the middle of a bunch of sheep. They're always on the go, to the farm, the ranch, or the range. All of that mobility birthed the sheep wagon a very long time ago. Some folks call it an early version of the RV, perhaps inspiration for today's small house movement, or an historic sheep wagon getaway. And of course the closest thing to a gypsy wagon in Utah is a sheep camp. And I was thinking I'd love to buy one personally and have fix it up and restore it back to its old nature. Uh, and I did find my first sheep camper, and it was in deplorable condition like most of them were. And they are very hard to get because people say they've been in their family and they just want to keep them, but lots of people didn't keep them up. Not many people can claim the sheep wagon collection Nancy Long has gathered in Utah, Idaho, and Wyoming. And she's just getting started. The wagons will be refurbished and readied for guests. Eventually, these aging wagons will house kids, families, school events, and quietly educate all about the past. A lot of people, I found out, many, many, many people, they would start talking to me and their grandfather or their great-grandfather, and sometimes their father, they were sheep people. And I was quite amazed at how many people would say that they had gone out and slept under the sheep camp with their grandpa, up in the mountains, out in the West Desert. And so I just kind of got interested in how many people were in sheep. A veteran sheep man like Rodolfo Torres is right at home in the confines of a sheep wagon. 
And he's comfortable sharing the inside view of the only lifestyle he's really known. Yeah, they, they changed a lot, a lot. Because uh, I remember my, when I was younger, just a boy, I live in like, no, no, these kind of camps, you know. I sleep in like one tent or, you no, know, sometimes uh, the blankets is real bad and food, you know, sometimes it's not too good, but they changed a lot. They changed a lot. A sincere prayer. I like to give us a thanks to God for this food. Then a shared meal between Celestino, who's from Chile, and Rodolfo from Mexico. It tells us the rest of what we need to know about sheep wagons. Well, I live in happy here and I miss my family too. And I'm happy right here. We're happy. People say maybe it's crazy, but I like this kind of life today. It's a perfect. Yes, this over here, and I, I think so. This is the best life over here. You can eat it. And, mm. the sixth ranking state in the production of sheep, lambs, and wool. A familiar sight is the sheep pens jammed for shipping or shearing. So to start with, we feed them about half of one of these bottles three times a day. Picks the big ones for the cameras. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't... I didn't get one. 